Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Portal, the 1986 computer novel written by Rob Swiggett. This is the Amiga version. Uh, we're, we're deep into the story, so I, I won't do a, a resume, but please do check out other videos in the playlist if you'd like to find out what's going on here. Uh, we are doing another round of information checking, and we're going to start at Med 10. Apologies, by the way, if my voice sounds a little different at the moment. I am recovering from a uh, cold, so I'm a little bit congested still. Um, I will I will be checking the audio back. So if you if you are hearing this, um, I deemed it good enough quality to publish. Okay, let's check in on Psylink. I believe we were told last time that SciTech would have things for us. Um, so it might just be a one, a one-stop um, story update situation. Let's have a look. Indeed, there's the hibernation cryofield to read about and longevity schematics. I think I could do with some longevity schematics. But first, hibernation. General Science and Technology Information, Current Entry, Hibernation, Cryofield. Mm, not an interesting picture there. It has been widely reported that the hibernation cryofield produced, over time, a number of tangible external effects which include a low hum, distortion of visible light, internal shift of focus, and a widespread ambient milky blue glow of subtle radiations. Since there are no conscious sentience aboard the starships, Existence and significance of these effects are the result of telemetry extrapolation, data compaction and AI transforms. Frederick Morrow, chief scientist on the Hibernation Cryofield Development Program, parentheses 2021 to 2033 inclusive, in parentheses, predicted these effects. Only the earliest traces of a few of them were recorded during development and testing. Side effects were expected to be minimal or non-existent accepting only the potential for PDD cure. Okay, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what that relates to. seems to be something to do with the um, the hibernation kind of field that Wanda is in for, um, for deep space travel. Um, so I think we might the story might be switching back to Wanda. Because we did, she was mentioned at the end of, I think, the last entry we read. Okay, longevity schematics. Um, again, just the data corruption image there. Okay, longevity schematics. Longevity technology has developed in the first third of the 21st century. Uh, <laughs> nice typo here. Snatchery. Included a multiplicity of approaches, field adjustments on the cellular level, internal and individual genetic manipulation, neurochemical, hormonal, peptide and enzyme adjustments, electrolyte balancing, attitude alteration, protein manufacture control, tissue response reversal, collagen, keratin and ion balance, including calcium, potassium, sodium and trace metals, were included. The net result was an effective lifespan of upwards of 114 years before irreversible age changes set it. Set it. Set in? Maybe. Few individuals had reached optimum age by 2090, however. One notable exception was Dick Moore Seminole Gad, otherwise known as Mentor, who, despite the advanced age at which he began longevity treatments, managed to survive longer than expected. Well done, Dick Moore. So again, not really sure how this, how any of this stuff feeds into the ongoing narrative, particularly. Let's check in with history. We'll do the full round as we, as we usually do. Um, and art, it uh, <laughs> documentation. Ant art, parentheses documentation. 
Little has come to the intercorp world from Antarctica in the form of artefacts produced for aesthetic pleasure only. What is known follows. Ant's work was so-called natural products. Stone, occasional rare wood, bone, leather, grown filament, and in some undocumented instances, ice itself. Tools include laser scalpels, computer simulated hollow projection matching, various knives, blades, augers, awls, needles, and scrapers, parentheses also made from a variety of substances. Many are microprocessor or picoprocessor controlled or assisted. And visual arts bear some resemblance to Eskimo arts, which include small scale stone and bone, parentheses or ivory sculpture, scrimshaw, and woven or worked leather artifacts. Representations range from highly abstract spiral forms, apparently visualizations of quantum physical concepts, to demonic or angelic masks, parentheses, which in turn have been compared to Japanese no drama masks, in parentheses, and life size sculpture of a public or monumental nature. Much ant art is extremely small scale and finely detailed, to be worn or projected, apparently. Colour is used sparingly, is extremely subtle, and ranges into UV or IR spectral bands, where ant visual acuity has been augmented. Ooh, nice, so they've got expanded visual range, so their visual arts can, uh, uh, can make use of that. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, that's the only history section to read right now. Uh, military? Anything in military? I feel like military's got to come in, got to come in useful at some point. Nope, but not today. Life support. Okay, yes. Yeah, so we've got to resume our uh, our stats reading. So we um, we got as far as Telus Hoskins last time, didn't we? So uh, Edward Dens is where we need to start. Okay, Edward Dens, uh, born thirteenth of the fourth, twenty fifty four, Montreal, assigned male. And then we'll go through the stats, so we've got blood pressure, which is going to pop up in a moment there. We have temperature, which looks a bit like that. Uh, respiration. Heart rate. Okay, tension. There. DNA and hormones. Neurotransmitters. Glycogen. There we go. Okay. And then we get back to the main menu. Alright, we've got to got geography to check out to see if there's anything there for us. There uh apparently is not. Okay, we'll search for more stats. Okay, let's get down to Edward Dens. Okay, let's check out the family tree there. Okay, so Edward Dens, the child of Bobaloo Dens and David Dens. Um, Bobaloo is descended from Evita Jones and Jimmy Jones. David from Trixie Dens and Scotty Dens. There you go. Uh, physiology and ESP. There we go, that's those. And some basic core IQ categories are assessed to be thus. And 
there and we're straight back into more Edward Dens and psychology. Let me just scroll down a little bit here. There we go, Edward Dens. There we go, so emotion. There we go, pretty balanced by the looks of it. Personal growth. And basic core IQ. There we go. So some slightly different categories there. You know what? I do admire whoever had to sit down and think about the characters in these terms for basically any named character in the piece. This is quite an abstract way of thinking about a set of characters. Ca uh, characters are normally defined in, in narratives by their um, by their behaviour, by their actions. Uh, but yeah, this is more an, <laughs> more uh, by their um, school reports and their uh, their biology. Okay, we do have an image for this thing here in central processing. Um, a nice chart there. So this is central processing ref hash 9875176. Download life support file a stroke 43845. Oh, some exciting capitalization here. Okay. Mentor aka Ditmore Seminole Gad. Alert! Emergency override. Electrolyte levels, basal metabolic rate, nerve growth factor, acetyl acetylcholine stroke neurotransmitter complex synthesis, all life support levels declining. Time determination, less than 175 seconds. Time relevant information, eyes only. CP extrapolation of local aerobus node, LS, data, probe 5. We are aware no eyes for this message exist at this time. Homer subbox data transfer comment. So that was almost unintelligible, but they seem to be Seems to be a report of the uh, the life functions of um, mentor. It was some real gad um, failing, um, but like we've experienced before, I, this section in central processing does seem to give the impression of sending out uh, probes in the current moment as we're looking for information. But then the reports we receive back seem to be um, backdated. Edward Dens here, the last set of stats to look at from Edmod. So we've got last set of basic core IQ categories uh, represented thus, and we've got logic to look at. There we go. High inductive reasoning, excellent. We've got memory, a memory assessment here, um, high across the board. And social adjustment is this one. There we go. Mixed bag there. Brilliant. So that's got us through an entire round of categories. Uh, we found a few things that we weren't already alerted to, so that's good. So hopefully there'll be um, a good chunk of Homer story to, to work through. Oh, Homer? I don't think it's anything because we haven't. Um... Yeah, no, nothing's. Okay, interesting. So we're going to do the round again. Uh, Meta. Interesting when it does that because it hasn't. And to my mind, it hasn't really pointed us in a particular direction at this point. But clearly, there's something we've missed. So we'll go back through them all. There was nothing in Med 10. We're, we're looking at Silink again now. Um, if Homer can hack us in. Yep, Vega Silink download 3. Okay, so we need to go back to this one. So this is going to be a Wanda related thing, I think. Yeah, maybe this is what we need to to loosen up some story, shake, shake some apples down from the tree, some story apples, 
and home image again there. Okay, Homer requests Vega Silent download. She was 26, her dark hair twisted high and bound simply. Overhead, empty skies vanish with a curious shifting quality. She could not look up at that strange sky, teasing her eye always outward, never satisfying with a solid shape. She walks slowly, the small tips of her golden sandals nosing from under her long gown, the gown itself shimmering with diamond sparkles. Sorry, I, I was imagining sparkles there. Diamond sparks that threw the strange, almost violet skies outward. As she walked, she looked demurely down. Peter floated in some middle distance, watching her. He tried to read her mood from the solemn, almost shy way she walked, the clean set line of her jaw. He felt the extent of her world was infinite. There were no walls, no horizons, no limits. When he spoke, she did not answer, but walked without progress, the small golden tips of her sandals moving in and out, in and out. He called to her again, but there was no response. He felt his way through the equations. The relationships between quantum mental activity and the tensed web of shape and energy in the universe cried out for action. A place to stand and a lever long enough could move the world. The world needed moving. The suffocation of its benign authority grew ever more deadly. Peter groped through the limitless dark toward Wanda, yet could approach no closer. He turned away and heard her call. Peter? Her voice was hesitant. Peter? He tried to answer without turning. Yes, I'm here. Peter? The equations glowed. They pointed toward the spot, the lever. The numbers were too large, though. Sons of suns would be needed, a flux of axions more dense and vast than anything the starships could seize and squeeze to make them go. Such a small thing of the human mind, so puny and weak, yet how rich and complex. Peter pushed through velvet dark that was more than an absence of light. His was the nightmare walk, the motionless tread of panic. Long, unfeeling fingers held him back. He struggled against the fear, against the heavy, wet clutch of his desperation. There was a twist as if something broke, and Wanda vanished into that awful, not-quite-violet, non-sky. Something in the depths of the world, through which he tried to make his way, appeared before him at every turn. A form without a face. Peter stopped struggling suddenly. He let himself feel the tides moving through the substance of his flesh. Did he fall? Was his body altered through pain, forged and annealed through genetic fires, drifting down and away? He felt the distance between himself and Wanda yawn wide. It was not, he felt, the terrible plunge of her ship through space that took her away from him, but some small tidal force that increased their separation by minute increments. The dark figure flickered for a moment in sudden lightning, then vanished into a greater black once more. The shape had a name then, the name of his fear and uncertainty. Where am I? Peter asked, but the figure heard him no better than Wanda had. He was in a sea that was not salt, was not water. Sensations of increasing pressure pushed at him as he drifted. He froze. His downward drift was halted by the suspension of all motion. Nothing held him, yet he was gripped tightly. If he could kick, he might move, yet where he now found himself, there would be no motion, no kick to free him. Did he see, far overhead, a distant sun, so faint it was a mere fancy on the blank undersurface of his empty sea? Do I lie? Of course. He was not alone. Another presence mocked him. I did nothing, the figure said. Nothing. You stopped yourself. All my efforts, and you stopped yourself. How is it you can speak to me? Peter asked, but there was no answer. The sleeper dreams the universe, Peter said. No answer. Where am I? No answer. What will happen when he awakes? When he awakes? Awake! Sound was more terrible than silence had been. Close at hand, vast buildings fell. Metal rent apart in a cataclysm too grand and awful to understand. Huge undersea tankers collided in the cold dark without warning and exploded in awful roaring, in terrible sudden light. A hollow booming filled all the dark universe with pain. Waves of sound beat on the shores of Peter's mind with endless repetition. One after another, without pause. Mountains fell. The earth groaned. Seas lifted sheets of ice two miles thick and let them fall one against another. With the sound came more lights. The bright flicker of phosphines inside the eyeball itself. Faces that stared in shock and horror 
for a fragmentary moment before whirling away. Wanda called in pain. Peter! Okay, that was strangely abstract. And uh, entirely subjective by the looks of it. So we do, yeah, in Silent we do get these weird... Um, probably the most abstract um, narrative segments when they turn up. So I don't know if Homer is now... Homer is now probably ready to, to do stuff, but we might as well um, conclude our our round through all of these to see if there's anything new. Also a chance to fit in another um, set of stats as well while we're, while we're at it. Um, okay. Yeah, there might not be anything in the other categories. Nope, not there, anyway. Alrighty, so our next character will be... Um, Rover Hicks. I think we've uh, heard more about Rover than perhaps some of the other ones we've been speaking about. So, Rover Hicks, assigned male, uh, born on the 4th of... July 2058 in Springfield. Which Springfield? Anybody's guess. Um, I think a specific Springfield has been mentioned before in the story, although I forget which. Uh, first up, let's get blood pressure on screen. There we go, so we can have shown that. Temperature. There. Uh, respiration. And GSR. Heart rate and EEG. Tension. Uh, DNA and hormones. There. Neurotransmitters. There. Glycogen. There. Okay, that's those. We're going to head through geography on our way. Do a bit of location scouting. Nope, nothing new there. Alright, in that case, let's head to Wasatch. the details for Rover that are kept here. Okay, so we've got family tree. Rover Hicks, child of Glynis Hicks and Omar Hicks. Omar Hicks is descended from Shelley Hicks and Henry Hicks. Glynis Hicks is descended from Tef Coston and George Coston. Uh, so, physiology and ESP. There you go. And basic core IQ categories here are delineated like this. There you go. Brilliant. So we will head through psychology as well. We'll pick up the rover, rover parts of this. There we go. So emotion. Emotional assessment is presented like this. Personal growth assessment is this. And the basic core IQ categories here are these. There we go. Okay, so that's the central processing to double check. Yep, nothing there. Okay, so I am 
I'm hoping that once we've got through the last page of stats for Rover here in Edmod, that uh, Homer does actually have some story for us. Does that be good? There we go. So these are the, uh, the core IQ stats that are kept here. We'll go memory next. There you go. Then we'll head to social adjustment. That's that. And then finally logic. There we go. Alrighty. Okay, so. Hi, my friend. What have you got for us? Okay, we have unlocked the Peter DeVore section of Narrative 2. Um, possibly DG? Who's DG? Dipmore Seminole Gad? Yes, Dipmore Gad. There you go. Peter DeVore Dip, Dipmore Gad section. Mentor was lying on a bed. The wall behind him, the screens and hollows, the telltales in coloured light, all indicated his slow decline as they dimmed. The old man's parchment lids flickered open. The eyes themselves, networked with tiny scars from gunial transplants, turned toward Peter, who stood in the doorway, touched with fear. Mentor lifted his hand and gestured with a motion so small it was almost not a motion. Peter came close and sat beside the bed. Although the old man's lips seemed barely to move, his amplified voice was clear and strong. Peter, he said, fixing the boy with his strange eyes. Yes? As you know, I've always felt that matter is only the pattern mind makes, and mind is a local phenomenon. I know your aphorisms, mentor. Peter said with a smile, which the old man faintly mirrored. Yes, of course. An old man's mind wanders at times. Your mind never wanders. Ah, you are the one, there is no doubt. Listen, the time is very close, very close. The world will soon be at war unless you act. There are things yet undone. The world is already at war. <laughs> you don't understand, young one. Intercorp will invade this continent, and soon. The ants are ready, of course, but the ENC may succeed in getting in here. We cannot ignore the rest of the world, Peter, so when the invasion comes, I want you to do something. What? I want you to leave. You must get away from Psyche, from McMurdo. You have heard of Terminus. The Lost Dry Valley is a legend, of course. Mentor shook his head, so slightly it was almost a tremor. Look it up, Peter. It is no legend. To the east and south of here lies Terminus, the only place in Antarctica with trees. Trees? That's not possible. Mentor's thin smile disagreed, but he said nothing. You must go there, you and the others. Take Thatcher and the others on the project, as many as you need. Do not stay to fight the invasion. This is very important, Peter. If they get to you, the world is lost. I can see that clearly. You are too important. You are a man now. The most important in the world. You must finish. You must find the portal. What? What do you mean, what portal? Again, the head rocked on the pillow. The portal, the way in. Beyond the portal is the realm, Peter. The hidden dimensions. But the energy, there isn't enough power even for a probe. Mentor's hand reached out suddenly and seized Peter's wrist in a strangely powerful grip. We just got the message, Peter. What we were looking for, it has all come around. Long ago I planted Watcher viruses in WorldNet. They found you when you tapped into Psylink. Now they found the power. An unhurried female voice spoke from overhead. Electrolyte levels are dangerously low. Mentor has entered anaphylactic shock. A physician entered the room and moved to the console, where he spoke rapidly. 
images formed and flickered around Mentor's bed as adjustments were made to his physiology. Suddenly the old man sat half upright, still holding onto Peter's wrists. Fragments delude us, he whispered, his voice suddenly frail as he moved out of the amplifier field. Then he fell back with a sigh. He did not breathe again. I'm sorry, the doctor said. He was kept on far behind his time, I'm afraid. When Peter turned after staring dry-eyed for a long time, he saw Larin and Shem and the others gathered in the doorway. What did he say? She asked. He said fragments delude us. What does that mean? And what did he mean, now they've got the power? Rover asked. I heard him say that. They found the power. What did he mean? I don't know, Peter replied shortly. I don't know the answer to either question. Oh, mysterious. Okay, a th further narrative for Peter DeVore. Let's follow it through. Night was falling, as night does in the Antarctic, in a series of dips as the sun fell below the horizon and rose again in a long ellipse around the compass. Out toward the Antarctic convergence, the cold waters drew closer together and began to solidify into a semi-jelly. Pack ice drifted together, bergs and chunks gathered and pushed up against the coastal shelves. The penguins and skuas and seals moved away, toward warmer land further north, or out to the convergence where warm water met the cold. The faint flush of green from algae and moss vanished from the margin of the continent. The periods of dark had grown longer over the past few weeks since Mentor's death. Peter spent more and more time in the lab. At night he dreamed of wonder, or of the portal and the realm beyond though what they were he could not say. Some days after he'd started to search for the power source, he got a call from the computers, which scrolled past him a series of coordinates, estimates and power output figures, labelled ISAT. Astronomical satellite? Peter queried. As the computer answered in the affirmative, the invasion began. OK. I'm guessing Peter didn't didn't really get out quick enough then. So no more. No, we're gonna have to go hunting for more. More after that that juicy juicy bait was dangled on a hook in front of us. There you go. Okay, we'll leave it there. Cliffhanger. Um. You know what? If there's an invasion, the military might even be the place to look. We'll have to find out next time. Thank you very much for joining me for another episode of reading through some of Portal. Um, if you enjoyed it, then uh, please feel free to let me know. Um, and you can subscribe to the channel to uh, be notified when new episodes go live. Thank you once again, and until next time, take care. Bye bye! Clutch.